Hello everybody, it's early morning here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I thought I'd do my annual question and answer session. I do this normally about once a year, sometimes twice a year. The last one I did was about a year ago. And uh, over the year I collect questions that I get. Uh, if I get the same question more than five or six times, I write it down. And these come sometimes in the comments section of YouTube and sometimes by email. So both. So let's get started. Uh, the first question I got or I get that's pretty common is what's with all the baseball shirts? So you see here I have a baseball shirt on. I'll tell you quickly or as quickly as I can. Uh, my father designed the uh, Major League Baseball logo this thing and let's see hopefully that works you can see that I can't put it up on the screen because they would probably sue the hell out of me Major League Baseball that is but he designed that in 1968 as uh, the anniversary 100th anniversary of Major League Baseball uh, he was hired to do it uh, by a company that he was working for. In other words, they had uh, maybe four or five graphic designers on staff. I'm not sure how many. And they assigned him this project with some other folks um, because he had just finished another project. And he did it in an afternoon, probably about four or five hours, drew it freehand, which he did everything. And then what they do is they submit the designs to Major League Baseball, all the designs that they assign the folks to do. And then Major League Baseball, I, I guess Bowie Kuhn, not sure that's the right pronouncement of his name. He was the um, commissioner at the time. He picked my father's design, which was a surprise to my father <laughs> and also the company that he worked for. Well, anyway, uh, that was really neat because he was a big baseball fan back then. And uh, he was a Brooklyn Dodgers fan, and then they moved to L.A., and then he became a Yankees fan. So uh, he was really pleased by that. But the interesting thing is, over all these years, uh, literally, you know, uh, I guess it's been, you know, f over 50 years now, that logo has not changed at all. <laughs> and usually in the graphic design world, logos change a lot. Uh, you know, little little minor things and sometimes complete overhauls. He did a lot of other things during his career. He did uh, work for Nabisco and uh, as a freelance guy. And several other c big companies, he did a lot of things that you see on the, uh, on the store shelves all the time. But those have all been altered to a certain extent. This one has not been altered at all, and they still use it. Now, my dad didn't get paid much at all for it, and he never got any royalties uh, or anything like that. But he wanted to um, be recognized for it at some point, and so he had to prove that he did it because things had been lost. So what happened was my mom, uh, who was tenacious in these matters, took it upon herself to get Major League Baseball to recognize him before he passed away in 2015. And they did. She fought a long battle. And she was such a sweet person that, uh, you know, you had to love her. And I guess they did, too. And so he was honored at Yankee Stadium in, I believe, 2011, somewhere around that. And then uh, City Field, Mets stadium around the same time i went to one of them i couldn't go to the other but it was pretty amazing he went on the field and did this whole thing you can look it up on um, the internet his name was jerry dior there's a lot of information you can read about it it's pretty interesting but anyway when uh, my mom passed last year we had to clean out her house and my dad had just i don't know a hundred of these kinds of shirts that he had collected with the logo on there. So we split them up between the, the kids and I got a, I got a several of them. So I put a shirt on every once in a while. Uh, makes me think about him and also they're comfortable. <laughs> so I'm not real picky about what I wear as you can tell 
on the channel. If something's clean, I put it on, I shoot a video. Not, you know, I'm not a fashionista. So that's the story about that. And like I said, look it up. It's pretty interesting. Someone else claimed to do it for a while, for years actually, which I know drove, uh, drove my dad crazy. And finally they proved that he did it. And uh, that was that. So he passed away a happy man, I hope, from that. Okay, so that'll be the longest, <laughs> longest topic I cover right there today. Got a lot of questions on Wilcox and Rolls. Again, I thought I answered all these, but we'll go over this briefly. I got a little pad here. So the Wilcox and Rolls that I cover in the uh, All-American Drummer, as well as Rudimental Swing Solos, they can be written in several different ways. Sometimes they're written with a drag in front. I'll put one up here so you can see it. That drag becomes part of the roll. So it's not a separate drag. So if it says 15 stroke roll, those two notes you play for that drag become part of that 15. A good example is solo number three in the Wilcoxon book. So if you look at that, and we'll put on this metronome here, and if we take it a little bit slower, I'll play a little of that for you and just listen to the rolls. One, two, one, two. So you see there how it might say seven stroke roll, but that drag connected to it makes it a seven. Also, if the drag's connected to it, you come in right away with the roll. So a seven's like this. If it doesn't have that drag, it would sound like this. So there would be a quicker pace of the roll because it's on the and instead of the e. So instead of one e and a two e and a, it's one and two and. That seems to be uh, a thing that confuses a lot of you out there, but that's just the way he wrote those rolls. In the book, there's a lot of different notation for the rolls, and you must follow it. Uh, towards the end, when he does the one-pagers uh, in the 130s, you'll see all kinds of, uh, within the same piece, alterations of the way he writes these rolls. So please try to follow those. If you watch my videos, uh, I did the whole book, all 150 of them, you can see me do it, and you can slow it down on YouTube. I did a video where I showed you how to do that. Just go under the settings and, and just slow it down the video, and you can see it and hear it slower. So that's what I suggest. But that's how the rolls work. That's how they're notated. So I hope that takes care of that forever. All right, transcribing. Got a lot of videos on transcribing because I talk about that a lot. I think transcribing is extremely important. Everybody should do it. Not only does it help you read better, you listen over and over, so you internalize what that player is playing. Now, not only should you transcribe drum charts, uh, in other words, solos, you should transcribe the band chart, in other words, like a lead sheet. So like if you have a big band chart you want to transcribe, just do the kicks. Don't do exactly what the drummer's playing. And that's really great for your reading. I did that lots and lots. And that helped my, you know, reading tremendously. It's kind of reverse engineering. You know, you're writing out what you're hearing. And it doesn't matter how long it takes you. Just start, work on it. Hopefully you have a teacher that can take a look at what you're doing and uh, correct it. <clears throat> so that's what you want to do. And you could follow sort of the templates that you see online for some of these transcriptions. There's a lot of stuff on there. As far as what everything looks like, you know, or the hi-hat might be an X the lines for the toms, and all that stuff. But instead of buying the books all the time, you should try to transcribe things yourself, even if they're available. And then you can check them against the original. Uh, I have my students work on lots of published solos that are written, as well as transcribe. So both those things work hand in hand together. So yes, you should definitely transcribe is the answer to that question by your, you know, yourself, not just reading solos. Okay, I get a lot of, a lot of uh, questions on relationships. Uh, I don't know why. I'm certainly not an expert. I've been married a long time. I think it's coming up on 30 years. Maybe my wife and I will sit down and do a video. That, that would be hilarious. I'd probably have to edit that. I don't do a lot of 
editing or hardly any in my videos. That one would probably need heavy editing. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. You know, somebody emailed me asking if they should get married. Uh, and actually, they told me their situation. It was really interesting. And I emailed back and we got into a discussion. But yeah, if you're in love with someone, definitely get married to them if you feel like that's the right thing to do. The only thing that I recommend is that you guys are on the same page as far as, you know, if they know you're a musician, you're going to be out working at night and gigging like I do. Make sure your your wife or your husband knows that that's what's happening. <laughs> uh, and that's the life that, that they're going to um, be living forever. Because when you get married, you should try to get married forever. You don't plan on not being married. That gets expensive, as a lot of my friends can attest to. So I'll, I'll maybe do a video on that. A lot of you want to you ask about uh, seeing my wife on the videos again. That's a little creepy, but uh, but maybe maybe we'll do one. Okay, all right. Uh, I got some um, emails about uh, drumstick quality these days, as far as the mass manufacturers. I don't know what to tell you. You're right. It's getting worse. Uh, I I've had students who get different sticks from different manufacturers, and they're they're just not good. Um, they're, they're weighted wrong. It's, well, first of all, it's hard to make a pair of sticks that's exactly weighted by the gram exactly the same. That's okay. You're not going to feel a gram. A one gram is lighter than a feather, okay? But when it gets into the three or four gram difference, you may start feeling that. Definitely you'll feel five grams and up between sticks. But don't worry if it's like one or two grams. But the thing about a lot of the sticks now is that they don't feel like they used to. They don't feel solid. I think that's because the quality of the wood has gotten worse. Uh, it's hard to find good wood. There's not a lot of old growth trees that are being harvested. Most of it now are trees that are being planted and they're harvesting them. That is an issue. A lot of the great drumstick wood in the old days came from heartwood, which is the center of the tree. When I make my sticks, the heavy ones, I have to use heartwood, which is very expensive and actually can be hard to work with, too. So, uh, you know, when I get my wood for my sticks, I'm really careful about it. But, you know, it's wood, so it's going to always be different. I make a lot of duds, a lot of sticks that just don't work, and I never sell those. I got boxes and boxes of them. If anyone's interested in them, I'll sell them cheap to you. Uh, but these are sticks uh, that I can't sell because they're not, they don't match. You know, and one might feel different than the other. I'm really careful about that. But a lot of the manufacturers, they spit these things out. They'll make hundreds of pairs a day of a certain model. And inevitably, if you don't have good wood, that's going to happen. So the only thing I could tell you is make sure when you buy sticks that you could send them back. I know that's weird. But if you buy a lot of them, you could send them back. Now, one thing you might want to do is buy 20 pair. And then you could take that 20 pair and match them up individually. That might work for you. Okay, I also get a lot of questions on my own stick, my drum set stick, which is this. I don't know if this camera is going to pick this up, but uh, Vic Firth makes this stick for me, and uh, they did it back in the uh, early 90s, very early 90s, maybe late 80s. I was doing clinics for them, and great guy who actually runs the company now, Neil Larrabee, um, he worked with me to make this stick. It's kind of a combination of an SD9 and a Bolero tip, but with some modifications. The neck is different. The length is different. And I always use this stick on drum set. Uh, I am making versions of it out of, out of persimmon for some people uh, that are a little different that I really like, and I've been using those on drum set. Problem is they're expensive. Uh, you know, a pair of persimmon sticks making them, uh, me anyway, it's going to be about 50 bucks. Uh, you, if you could buy a pair of sticks in the store, it'll probably be about, I don't know what even what they go for now, but probably 10 to $20. So anyway, that's what the, my, the stick on drum set, that's what it is. It's not available to the general public uh, right now. It's not. So uh, that's, that's about the stick. I get a lot of questions about my rivets video. Uh, some folks say, oh, yeah, just I take a hand drill and drill it. Well, if you do that, what can happen is you could try to drill it, especially someone who's not used to using a hand drill. And if you don't put enough pressure on it, that drill bit, uh, and especially if the bit is not 
a really, really good bit with a tip on it will slide on that symbol and, and create a horrible looking scratch. So for those of you who are recommending people do that, don't listen to those folks. Uh, you will ruin that symbol. I know because the first symbol I tried to rivet like that, I did exactly that. It was a Peisty 602, a really nice symbol, and I was so upset for weeks because of that. I basically used an inferior drill bit and uh, a hand drill, in other words, a plug-in drill, and, uh, you know, I thought I applied enough pressure, but the thing just skated right over and created about a two-inch scratch. So I suggest using a drill press, and I'm going to, um, I got a symbol recently that's pretty amazing. I'm going to do a little video on it, and I'm going to show you how I drill that. It's a new Chinese symbol that's just insanely great. And I'll put some rivets in that, and I'll do it again for you and show you how I do that. Because Chinese symbols are a little bit different, how you have to rivet them. But please, if you don't know what you're doing, use a drill press. There's literally no way you can put a scratch in that symbol. Also, you can go slow enough because you can change the speed on a drill press where you can go nice and slow, hold it down. Uh, I've never, ever had any trouble drilling a symbol with the drill press. So we'll do that again, and I'll explain everything once again with that video. Uh, okay, I got a question. Do you watch your own videos? Actually, that was an interesting question. After I make them, I do not watch my own videos because like most people, I, can't not, I cannot stand the sound of my own voice. <laughs> and so I might watch something if someone points something out and I have to look back, but it's always cringy to me. So just like authors don't read their own books and musicians don't listen to their records, uh, which I don't do that either, I do not watch my own videos again. So whatever it is that day, it is that day. I hardly do any editing. Um, every once in a while, if I stammered like for three minutes or more, or if I, uh, you know, didn't like I'm doing right now, <laughs> or if I didn't uh, take, you know, do things fast enough, I got the wrong click or something, I'll do a quick cut to save you guys time. But no, I don't do any editing and I don't watch my own videos. So hopefully they're good. <laughs> I don't know. All right, back pain. Lots of um, questions on back pain and shoulder pain. So we'll talk about that quickly. I don't have too much back pain and I'm in my late 50s. Uh, I do exercise, I walk a lot. That's one thing I love to do. I take really long walks, five mile walks, almost every day. If not outside, then on a treadmill. Um, I suggest you all do that. That'll keep your drumming uh, fresh. You know, it's good. Exercise is good for you. It makes you feel good. If you're going to sit for a long time on a drum throne, like I do, because I practice and play a lot, that's terrible for your back. So you need to get up and walk around. So I would suggest doing that every day. I did my health and wellness videos. I suggest going back and watching those. I did one on back and shoulder pain and talking about that. You know, one of the main things is how you sit. You put the weight on your torso and don't put the weight on your feet. Don't play into the bass drum because if you do that, you're putting weight forward and that can strain your lower back. Sit at a good height, chair height, which is ergonomic. Don't sit too high, don't sit too low. That's the worst thing you can do. So your leg is going up. I like my leg to have a slight angle. Sometimes I sit a little higher, like today I'm higher because I have to, you know, talk to you all, and so you can see my head better. But, uh, but you know, normally my leg is on that kind of angle, maybe five to seven degrees down, that's it. All right, so those of you who sit super high, you might have some trouble with your upper back because you're slouching down. Uh, I would suggest just exercise as much as possible. If you're having tremendous pain, go see a doctor, you know, and have some x-rays. You might have a disc problem. Uh, I don't do any kind of surgery. I don't recommend that. Again, I'm not a doctor. I just don't like the idea of people cutting into my body and making a mistake <laughs> that they can't fix. So I haven't had surgery yet on anything. Hopefully I won't have to have it. Then I had questions on shoulders, which is very common. I actually have two partially torn rotator cuffs that sort of refuse to heal. I got those from doing construction on a house that I built, uh, just moving heavy plywood sheets around on a roof. First I tore one and then I favored the other, so then I tore that. Not smart, okay, so I don't recommend doing that. 
Uh, they did heal up, but then I kind of messed them up again doing some more construction. I think my construction days are over as far as heavy construction. So, uh, but it's there and I can lift my arms now about there without much pain. Uh, when you tear them, uh, initially you can't lift them at all. And I can move them in back of my back now. So they're on the mend. They do heal. It takes quite a while, maybe a year. So uh, you can go and get it checked out, but all they're going to say is we can either do surgery or you could wait around for it to heal. I would suggest waiting around. Now, the older you get, the longer these things take to work themselves out. So uh, if you tear your rotator cuff, it could take a year or more to feel fine. But it does not affect my drumming, interestingly enough, unless I start to lift really high. Sometimes you'll see me on videos doing that now. Sometimes that's to relieve the pain just for a second. I'll do that. Uh, I don't know why it works, but for shoulder, sometimes if you go up like that and you go down like that, it'll actually feel better. I think you're just stretching. And I showed you some stretches also on that health and wellness video. Now, as far as the Muller technique goes, I got a lot of videos on that. So maybe I should do a video Muller tech for uh, the, the um, Muller technique for old folks like me. Uh, so I come in from the side. Instead of going up, like sort of like Jim Chapin did, I do more like the Morello way from the side. If you do that, then you get a lot less stress on your shoulder instead of doing that, because that hurts right now when I do that. But if you come in from the side, no, um, no stress at all. I, no problem with that. So that's something I'd recommend doing. Let me know if that wasn't clear, and, and I can uh, send you some more emails or, or, or with the comments and all that. All right. Uh, do I need to learn how to read? I thought I answered that in my last video. Yeah, you need to learn how to read. Uh, you really do. You'll, you'll get a lot more gigs. You'll get paid more on those gigs. And then you can teach better, obviously. You need to teach your students how to read. Uh, it's amazing how many teachers do not teach their students how to read or work on basic technique. I just saw that recently with a new student. They studied for three years, and all they did was play drum covers. That's ridiculous. That's useless. Yeah, you'll play in a bar band for the rest of your life, but if you want to be a professional musician, that's not going to work. The goal is to play until you're dead. We don't retire. We just keep playing. So you can't, you know, it's going to be hard for you to, when you're 60, 70, 80 years old, <clears throat> to be making a living if you... Uh, as a professional musician now, making a living, by that I mean supporting your family, put your kids through college, whatever, okay? That's making a living. I don't, I've never had another job besides music because I play a lot of different instruments, percussion instruments, and I read well. So the gigs I get pay more. So if you read well, you'll be able to do better gigs that pay more. And plus you'll be able to uh, teach better, obviously, and learn quicker. So yes, you need to learn how to read. That's the answer to that. And I'm not getting angry or mad, but it seems obvious to me, and I just don't know why musicians don't learn how to read, because it's easy. Anybody could learn how to read. Really, if you could learn the English language or any language, you could learn how to read music. It's simple compared to that. So please learn how to read. Uh, I got questions on my Wooster shirt, several of those. That's a college. A friend gave me that shirt. I just like it. <laughs> it's available, like I said before, with the baseball shirts. Uh, I just grab it, put it on. That's what's up with the Wooster shirt. Uh, symbols. Okay, lots of questions on symbols. I did several videos on symbols, probably four or five hours worth. So please go back and watch those. I did the ride symbols and the K Zildjian's and this and that. I'm a symbol nut. I'm a symbol junkie. I love symbols. Uh, I also love snare drums. And, and so uh, I have hundreds of cymbals and at least probably a hundred snare drums. So uh, this is something I like. I always like put, on, put up different ones and they feel good to play. My favorite cymbals, as you know, are the old Ks. And by the old Ks, I mean the ones made in Turkey and shipped over here in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and then they stopped. Uh, and so all my old Ks are from the uh, 30s, 40s, or 50s. Right here, I have a 50, pair of 15-inch hi-hats 
from the 50s. This old K is, um, I'll hit them for you so you can hear them. That's an 18 thin from, I believe, the 1950s, maybe 60s. Here are the hi-hats. These are amazing, these 15s. Uh, I got these relatively recently, last five or six years ago. I love these cymbals. And then I have my pride and joy, this 21-inch. A lot of you folks have asked me how heavy it is. I did put that in the... Uh, in the ride symbol video if you want to watch that so this symbol is I'm guessing I didn't go back and look but probably 23 to 2400 grams it's a 21 it's thin you can bend it the best ones were thin like that all right, uh, it's an old one. I know this was at least from the 1940s. So uh, it's got the old stamp on it. So anyway, that's what that symbol is. This one is an old 1950s, heavier 18-inch rod with rivets. And uh, like I told you in that video, the Kazo Gym video, uh, this was cracked when I got it, so I put three rivets in it. And sometimes I switch these, I move these two around. And finally, this symbol that I use a lot. This is a, a Peisty, older, uh, traditional. I don't think they make these anymore. It's a 22-inch swish. Some people say China, but, you know, China has that square bell on it. This just has a regular bell. And uh, this symbol I love. I put some rivets in it. I just got a new one, like I said before. And I'm going to uh, do a video on that because it's an amazing symbol. So stay, stay tuned for that. Okay. Almost done here. The last question we'll talk about today is uh, I get a lot of this on drummers who are burnt out. So as far as they're just tired of practicing and, um, you know, they're having trouble focusing. They don't know what to work on. You know, these kinds of things. You know, basically, I, I call all of that burnout where you just get tired of, you know, the same kind of thing and frustrated, really. I don't really get burnt out in that respect. I might get tired because I'm getting older. But, you know, when I feel like I'm getting bored or something, I just play a different instrument. Like, I'll play marimba. I'll focus on that. I think the best thing to do if you're burnt out is focus on something different. So if you just play drum set... Uh, and you're getting burnt out on playing maybe just rock, well, try to play some jazz or try to play some Latin music uh, or learn a different instrument. Learn the bass. Learn the piano. Those are things that are going to revitalize you and keep you from getting burnt out as far as, like, I don't want to play anymore, that kind of thing. I get a lot of emails from drummers who are older, and I love those, like, you know, in their 70s who are just starting to play again after a long career doing something else. Uh, they played when they were younger, then they stopped playing. And some of those I teach. Some of those are my students. And I love teaching those students because they're very, very enthusiastic about playing. They've already lived their lives and done, you know, you know, made their money and, and done what they needed to do. And now they want to enjoy their lives. And so they're playing again, which is really beautiful. So think of those folks when, when you get burnt out. Uh, but also, you know, you could take some time off. You don't have to practice every day. Uh, take a couple days off, do something else, clear your mind, let the dust settle, and then go back to it. But, you know, learn how to read, do some different things, and that'll keep you from getting permanently burnt out for sure. But you, it's a long slog, you know. You, you got to, this, this is a whole lifetime's worth of work, playing any instrument, becoming a virtuoso on it. It never ends. Even the greatest players were always frustrated musicians you know well van gogh he cut his ear off he's a great artist he just got sick of it so he, he was crazy he did that you know the the world is full of crazy composers uh music composers who did all kinds of crazy things and musicians who did you know substances and all don't do that you know they drink and they 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 did all the, all the drugs and everything i never do that i never did that i didn't find it necessary i just do different things to keep my mind active and uh 
you know, to keep me inspired. Also listen to other drummers. I do that a lot. Listen to records. Uh, all those things will inspire you and hopefully keep you from getting burnt out. So I hope this answers most of your questions for this year. And we'll see you back again if there are more questions next year. So take care of yourselves and we'll see you.